Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone this morning. We have visitors. We welcome you. We're so thankful that you're with us. Hope you'll come back whenever you possibly can. We're glad to see you. I'm glad to see everyone this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We're going to be talking about that story in just a few minutes. The story is told of a little country church. Folks would flock to it every Sunday. And there was one gentleman, sweet gentleman, that would lead the prayer quite often. And when he would lead the prayer, he would usually in his prayers, he would say something to the effect of, Lord, since the last time we approached your throne, there have been cobwebs that have gotten in between our face and yours, and we've been not able to behold your glory. We ask that you remove those cobwebs so that we can see your face yet but once again. So the brethren heard this over and over and over again. And one brother just couldn't stand it. He'd gotten tired of the same phrase. He'd gotten tired of the brother using the same phrase and seemingly the same issue over and over again. And so finally... One Sunday, as the brother got up to lead the opening prayer, he stood up and he said, Lord, he said, since the last time we were before your throne, he started with this same thing again. He said, Lord, please remove the spiders. And the brother just couldn't stand it. And he shouted out, no, Lord, kill the spiders. Kill the spiders. Let's get rid of them. But, you know, the reality of it is we live life. And as we live life, it's not always easy. Satan really comes at us. And comes at us hard. I was flipping through Facebook this week, and there was a, an old high school classmate of mine that I have no idea where she goes to church. She lives in West Tennessee, and she just made the fact statement. She said, "She said I had to go to church today more so than usual." She said the devil really had been after me this past week. Well, you know, I think that can be said of all of us. No, so many times we do need. While we move the cobwebs, we need the spiders killed in our life. There's a story told in Mark chapter 5. It's an interesting story. It's one of those that, at least when I was a child, it always gathered my imagination and always let my imagination run wild. And I remember those little felt things, those little felt flannel graphs that I think they use. I think that's what they call them. You won't use them anymore. We use PowerPoint. It's no different. But nevertheless, I remember that. And I remember some of my, my teachers. I remember Miss Gail Jones, especially telling this story. It's a story of a man that in Gadara, Jesus had crossed the sea, crossed the, the Sea of Galilee, had gone to the other side, and there in Gadara there was a man. Matthew says there were two. Mark just said, talks about one. But there were, we'll just say one man, since we're coming out of Mark this morning, that is living up in the mountains and in the tombs. And remember that basically what they're saying is he's lived, he lived, was living in the cemetery. The tombs were often dug out caves out of the mountainside and out of the hillside. And so the text says that he was living in the mountains and he was living amongst the tombs. And as this man was, he was demon-possessed. Demon possession is one of those things that's found in pages of the New Testament. You don't find it in the old. You, you don't find it, if you will, after the, the end, if you will, of Jesus we don't know a lot about demon possession. The Bible doesn't set out and explain it to us. It's evidently a true phenomenon. It was part of evidently Satan and his messengers that God allowed to be used for a period of time in order that God's power might be shown and that those that possessed it, possessed demons, they might have those demons cast out and thus ultimately, if you will, the power of God be shown to the folks. It has been suggested through the years that it was mental illness. I don't believe that. I believe the scriptures, like I say, they're there for a period of time, and then they're not. God had a purpose for them. Some have said that it's other issues, that they were fallen angels. But the Bible just doesn't tell us. We really know or have more questions than we have answers with regards to it. But this man is possessed with a demon. This man 
has such strength that he can break chains. And so no one is able to bind him. No one is able to, to, if you will, restrain him as he lives in the mountains, as he lives in the cemetery, he lives in the graveyard. He howls constantly. He howls at night. He cries out. Everyone, I'm sure, is scared of him. Everyone is afraid of him. Everyone, when they, when they hear him, it's sort of like hearing the coyotes in the middle of the night if they get close to your house. You don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear that screeching. You don't want to hear that hollering. And as Jesus comes up, this man runs out. Wanting nothing to do with Jesus. Don't, let, don't, don't have anything to do with, with me. There's a conversation, evidently, that ensues. The man is asked, what's your name? He says, called Legion. We don't know if that was literally his name or if that's what everybody had reference to him. That they may have just simply just stuck that on his, his as his moniker for him. Oh, there's a Legion out there. But he calls himself Legion because it means many. And he had many demons. And so, as this, this voice within this man takes over, if you will, and he says, don't let us go into the country. And Jesus, though, as we shorten the story, Jesus cast the demons out of this young man. Don't put us in the country, they've begged. And so Jesus, seeing some swine that are in the distance, has the power, the authority, tells them to go to the swine. And when he, this, these demons enter into the swine, they cause the swine to basically, if you will, jump off a cliff and into their peril. Now, think about it. Jesus has power over these demons. Jesus tells these demons where to go. And this man all of a sudden now is made whole. The people in the community hear what's happened. They don't hear, if you will, Legion anymore. They don't hear him hollering. They don't hear him beckoning. And yet they've heard the story somehow, don't know how, scriptures don't tell us, but the, they hear that what has happened is that, de, that Legion has had his demons cast out of him and that they have been cast into the swine and the swine have, cast, have been, if you will, plunged to their death. Probably those that kept the swine told them as they entered into the city. So, lo and behold, people began to come see. You see, everyone likes to see a good story. And while the news was not theirs to turn on on TV, they go out to find Legion. They go out to see him. What does he look like? He's sitting there. He's dressed. He's in his right mind. He's able to communicate with people. And all of a sudden, their eyes are opened. But there's a fear that comes upon the people. It's a fear not of legion anymore. Their fear is of Jesus. The one that they shouldn't have been afraid of, the one that they should have embraced, the one that they should have invited into their homes, the one that they should have loved on, that's the one that they're afraid of. And so they bid him to leave. And so Jesus does. As Jesus is leaving, as Jesus is getting back into his boat, as Jesus is going across, Legion wants to go with him. Who wouldn't? Imagine a man that has gone from being an outcast of society, and not only an outcast of society, but an outcast from his family, a man that has not really been able to communicate with anybody, a man of such strength that, that no one could contain him and no one would have anything to do with him, all of a sudden has found the one that is able to cure him, to make him whole. And so he wants to go with him. And what does Jesus say? No, go back to your friends, go back to your family, and tell them the great things that have been done to you. There's a lot about that story that's just intriguing. As a small child, the fact that swine, you know, jump off a cliff, that's just fascinating. But as an adult, there are other things that are fascinating and remind us 
of certain things that we want to be mindful of. One of the great lessons as I read that story is I ask the question, why do we really need sin in our life? Why did this man have the demons? Don't know. Like I say, there's more about demon possession that we don't know than we do. But it it gives us a a sense of an understanding of what even sin can do. And you might say, "Well, well, what is the connection between sin and demon possession? Well, like we say, demons seem to be, if you will, those messengers of Satan that overcome individuals and their abilities. What was it, though, in this man's life that really needed casting out? Well, there's the demons. Well, what did they do? And thus, in making application to sin, why do we need to kick sin out of our life? Because we're we're like the guy, the man that led the prayer. We we get cobwebs and we get them weekly. We're we're like the girl that I said, you know, needed to go. Satan was after us this week. Why is sin seemingly so bad while the world, if you will, loves sin? And you might say, well, preacher, nobody goes out and says, well, I'm going to sin tonight. No, but they know. And it's interesting that they know really right from wrong, and yet they still go out and do the things that are wrong. They wink at it and they smile as if it's all right. Maybe Peter was right. Matter of fact, not maybe, but surely Peter was right. In Second Peter chapter 3, where he talked about why folks weren't living the way they should. And he said, basically, why should we? All things have continued to this day, even as they were. In other words, Lord's not coming. We don't see the imminent coming of the Lord, and we don't see any, if you will, judgment of us. And so why can't we just continue to do what we're doing? And maybe that's the facet that the world's taking. But why why do we need sin out of our lives? Well, several reasons. First of all, because sin dominates you. Think about in verses 3 and 4, this young man. Think about the fact that he couldn't live with his family. Think about the fact that no one could chain him. Think about the fact that he he was ostracized by people, but not only ostracized by people, but he was ostracized from the standpoint of his own by himself. And it had so overcome him that he was seen as a person that we might say today is not in his right mind. Sin does that to us. Sin seemingly offers us liberty. It offers us great chances. It offers us a great lifestyle. It offers us the world, if you will. But all the time, and when it just gets the door cracked open, what does it do? Satan grabs us, and he says, you're mine. For the Bible tells us what? The Bible tells us that whoever you serve, whoever you yield yourself to, That's the one you become servants of. And so when Paul addresses that idea in Romans chapter 6, where he talks about, know you not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey his servants you are, whether of sin to death or God into righteousness. You have a choice. And so the Bible says you have a choice. But the reality of it is, is that when we give ourselves and you say, very few people will say that they are Satanists. Very few people will say that they worship Satan. Very true. But when we begin to practice the things of sin and the the practices of Satan, Satan, once he grabs us, does not want to let go. And so it becomes one thing right after another, right after another, right after another. And the Bible tells us don't serve sin. Don't let it dominate you. God hates sin. And while God hates sin, He loves the sinner, but he hates the actions. Preacher, God can't hate anything. Well, tell Solomon that in Proverbs chapter 6. Six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are abomination unto him. In other words, there are things God hates. Paul even said the same virtually in Romans chapter 1. You see, even the psalmist in Psalm 97, verse 11 says, those that love the Lord hate sin. It's that simple. The reason is, is because it becomes our master. It becomes our, 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 our 
one that we listen to and the one we answer to and the one we follow and the one that simply consumes our life. Oh, preacher, no, 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 no. I, you know, no, I, I do what I want to, and and I have the right and I have the ability to say no, and I have the right and I have the ability to say stop. But the question is, do you when sin dominates your life? Or does it become a slippery slope to the point in which you are so consumed and by it that that truly you are, if you will, once you wake up, trapped by it? I've spent time, I've talked with addicts, drug addicts, sex addicts, alcohol. I've even had an occasion not to talk to the individual, but to talk to a family member of an individual that was addicted to gambling. They didn't start out that way. They didn't start out to, to be an alcoholic. They didn't start out to, to be addicted to gambling. They didn't start out to be addicted to, to drugs. But little by little. And you see this there in, we sit in church so oftentimes and we say, uh-huh, that's who the preacher's talking about this morning. He's talking about the addicts. He's talking about those folks that are living out on the street, those folks that, that we see that, that are walking around that are have zombies. No, no, no. Because... Satan works on us little by little. And it's just one little thing here, and it's one little thing there. It's those things that we learn about that are wrong, those things we learn about that, that the Lord doesn't want us to do. And so we don't need sin in our life. Why? Because ultimately what it does is it just takes that little by little by little. The story <laughs> excuse me, of a man on a mountainside, watching, looking, actually, just looking, beauty of God's creation, sees off in the distance, sees what looks to be an eagle, and it's flying in its majesty, and he's watching it, and he is, he is appreciating it, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he sees it swoop down, and it comes back up above the trees, and he sees it, and it has something in its talons, it has something in its claws, and he can tell it's an animal, and he can tell that the animal is fidgeting, and he keeps watching it, and the, the eagle keeps soaring above with this, this animal in its talons, and, and, and as it keeps soaring, he keeps watching, but he notices that the eagle keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower until finally he pitches, does not land, he pitches into the ground. And he goes to where he thinks the eagle has pitched in the ground. He finds the eagle. And he finds the cause for the eagle's demise. You see, when he swooped down and gathered the animal, he gathered a weasel. And that weasel was literally sucking the blood out of that eagle as he was flying over with him. He says, that's what sin does. Grabs us. It doesn't let go. And it dominates us. That's why we don't need it in our life. But we don't need it in our life, secondly, because it destroys you. This demon possession of this man had simply not only dominated him, it had destroyed him. He was outside of society. He was outside of family. It had destroyed his good mind. And in probably many ways, if he had a good name, it had destroyed that. It had destroyed his home life. It had destroyed him. It had destroyed everything about him. Sin does the same thing. It destroys us. It destroys our good name. It destroys our reputation. Oh, preacher, that's for the hardened sinner, and they're not here at church this morning. Oh, but it's for us as well. It destroys us emotionally. It destroys us socially. It destroys us physically. Sin destroys us. That's at the end. That's its want. Sin even destroys our good self. What do I mean? The kindness, the compassion, the love that we're supposed to have for others, the hospitality that we're to show others, the fact that we're to serve others, the fact that we're to bear one another's burdens all of a sudden become 
things that are not important to us. They become not our priorities. They become something that is almost laughable. They become those things that, well, you know, when I have time, when I want to, that's what I'll do. I appreciate those that go by my house and either blow their horn or try to blow their horn at me if I'm out in the yard. I appreciate those folks. But I watch countless folks, and I know my house is off of the, the road but I'll be at the edge where the trees are gathering the sticks up and I wave at everybody. How in tune we are to the outside world may let us know what's got a hold of us. Sin takes us and sin destroys us. What what does the Bible say? Well, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 comes to mind, doesn't it? The wages of sin is death. You see, the Bible tells us very plainly that all that sin is separated from God. The soul that sins, it shall die. That's what Ezekiel reminds us in Ezekiel 18. Isaiah talks about, in in the book of Isaiah, the 59th chapter in verse 7, those that run to wickedness, those that beat the path, if you will, I'm paraphrasing this verse, beat the path to iniquity. That it becomes their ruin. That's a powerful statement, the last part of that verse. That it becomes our ruin. You see, that's that's what, what sin does to us. It destroys us. Inasmuch as sin destroys us, think about what God wants. First Peter chapter five, verse ten, God's the God of all grace who after you've suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You see, God's the God of all grace. And while the wages of sin is death, do you remember what Paul said? You've got to finish that verse in Romans 6. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Wow. Sin may destroy us, but not God. God gives us life. God gives us, if you will, his grace. And God says, I want you to walk in that grace. I want you to come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's our God. Our God does not destroy us. Our God builds us up. Our God gives us life. Our God gives us hope. Our God wants to take us home. Our God gives us the hope and the help that we need. Not to destroy us, but to build us up. We need sin out of our life because it destroys us. Thirdly, we need sin out of our life because it divides us from God. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, sin offers a whole different idea, doesn't it? Sin says, oh, do what you want to. Live your life in the liberty that you have. Live your life the way you want to. You make the decisions based upon you, not God. You don't have to listen to somebody else. You don't have to give yourself to somebody else. You do what you want to the way you want to do it, and you don't have to listen to anybody. There's liberty. Well, Jesus had already destroyed that. Jesus had, had told us that the freedom that we have is found in Christ Jesus. John 8, verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, while Satan and sin offer so many seemingly good points, so many good ideas, good things, and yet God says that's not true, that that sin removes you from my fellowship. I enjoy your fellowship. I enjoy your faces when you come in on Sunday. You're smiling. You're happy to, well, okay. Yeah, we got to listen to the preacher, but we're happy to be here because we're happy to see everybody else. You enjoy being here. Enjoy your fellowship as you leave. Enjoy your fellowship whenever I can get it. Enjoying being with you. Now think about God on a constant basis. Your fellowship with God, walking with God, walking in hand with God, being God's child, being able to look to God, being able to approach God 
his very throne, being able to talk to him and tell him your cares and your, your needs and your desires, being, being able to ask him for his help, being able to ask him if he'll, if he'll grab your hand and if he'll take you through whatever you're going through, whatever it may be, whether it's a huge problem or whether it's just the daily activities and transactions in life. But imagine, if you will, the other side of the coin. You're not in fellowship with God. You can't ask. Or you ask and he does not hear. Because you're not in fellowship with him. Where do you go? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? You can't do that if you're going to serve sin. You see, sin divides us from God. Sin separates us from God. We're much like Alexander Fleming, the great doctor of years gone by. Someone asked him what was the greatest discovery that he made. He said, the greatest discovery I ever made was that I'm a great sinner and God's a great forgiver. See, I'm thankful for the fact that God does forgive. That though our sins are scarlet, they should be as white as snow. Isaiah 1, verse 18, Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. I'm thankful that God is that God of grace we talked about earlier, but that God of forgiveness that will forgive us of our sins. And I can have fellowship with God. But what does it mean? It means that I have to, to hate that which is evil. I have to abhor, as Paul said in Romans 12, verse 9, I have to abhor that which is evil. I have to disdain that I have to be sure that I live my life as to say I want no part of it. Well, then we ultimately come to the question, preacher, how do you do that? You be people of the word. You be people that know the word. <laughs> in Bible class this morning, we spent time in Acts chapter 7. We studied the defense of that Stephen gave for the high priest. It was an eloquent defense. It carried him all the way back, if you will, throughout time, throughout, began at Abraham and went then to the patriarchs. And then he kept on going. He went through Moses. He knew his stuff. Do you know your stuff? Kids just got through taking finals in college. Schools, some high schools still give, some, one or two, still give finals. It's a study of what you know. But when, especially in college, in graduate school, when those times came, that's when I really buckled down the hardest. I buckled down all the time. But that's when I buckled down the hardest. And every once in a while, I sit and as I'm studying, I'll think, I know such and such. Where did I re where did I get that? And then I think back to a particular professor, and I remember getting it in his class. And I studied it so hard for test, but I still remember it to this day. Some 30, well, yeah, 38, 39, oh, 39 years, ooh, 39 years. Shh, won't tell anybody. Long time ago. Are we people of the word? I don't want to be divided from God. Sin does that. God brings me back. And then that brings us to the fourth point. Why in the world do we not need sin in our life? Because sin brings death. The wages of sin is death. That's what Paul said We a while ago in Romans 6. See, sin offers life. Sin looks good. Sin looks appealing. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's on TV. It doesn't matter if it's pictures. It doesn't matter what it may be. Whatever violates the will of God is sin. Sin is, is defined as transgression. It may be de defined as iniquity. It may de be defined as missing the mark. What does all that mean? It just means that when it doesn't go along with what God said to do, then it's sin. Sin's ultimate promise is, oh, give you life. It's the good life. Man, if you want to live life, live like a sinner. Live this life. And the Christian says, no, 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 I've got to have self-control. I've got to live with God. I've got to live for God. 
I, I've got to be an individual that, that follows God's will, that answers his call. You see, the Bible says Satan gives you nothing of what he promises. It's sort of like if you ever... Have you ever gone to look maybe on a website? We do it now on a website. When first, Suzanne and I first got married, one of the things that we would do is we'd plan our vacation, and Suzanne would, would write to the Chamber of Commerce, and we'd get all these brochures from all the places, you know, right in that area of, of what you needed to see and where you need to go. You don't do that anymore. You get on the Internet, and you look at all of it, and it's a lot more convenient in many ways. But needless to say, you ever gotten one of those brochures or maybe looked on the website, and, man, this was beautiful? And you got there, and it was nothing like the picture. I mean, the picture was probably true 20 years ago. And they haven't fixed it up. They haven't painted it up. They haven't done anything very nice in the last 20 years. Suzanne and I, back several years ago, was going to stay in a very nice, I'll get it right, hotel. I always get that. Motel, hotel. I, they're all the same to me. It ain't, it's called, it ain't where I sleep. But anyway, you know, it's, it's we were going to a very nice one to celebrate something. And we, we forked the money out and got in there. And the room was dirty. Not clean, dirty. Not dirty. Dirty, dirty. That's what sin promises. Clean, good, fresh, wholesome. And when you open up the door, it's not. It's dirty. Sin brings death. But what's the gift of God? Eternal life. The thief comes but for to steal and kill and destroy, Jesus said. And I am come that you might have life. John 10, verse 10. And you might have it more abundantly. The thief comes to steal. Satan comes to steal you away from God. Satan says, you don't need to have anything to do with God. God said, Jesus says, just hold on. I offer you peace. I offer you forgiveness. I offer you life. I offer you hope. Follow me. Not just part of the time. Not just some of the time. Not just when you want to. Not just when it seems convenient. But this is the record, John says. John 2, verse 25. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And that life, John says in 1 John 3, is in his son. Dear friends, we, we don't need sin in our life. We need the Lord. That's who we need in our life. But we need the Lord in our life, not just on Sundays. And not just when we think of the preacher or we think of the elders or we see our Bible sitting there. We need Jesus in our life every day of the week. Every hour of the day, every minute of the day, every moment of the day, we need Jesus in our life. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, we got to go out and we got to stand on the street corner and preach Jesus. We, we got to be individuals that we're constantly in prayer. And we, no, you carry your life normally. Whatever you may do, retired or profession, you carry it out normally. But you let and make sure that the light of Jesus is seen in you everywhere. Why? Because you love the Lord and you follow him above all else. And so this morning, if you're not a New Testament child of God or you need to rededicate your life, our prayer is that you'll come. All together we stand and sing.